Boldwood presents Sisters of the Resistance Written by Gina Bacar and read by Laurel Lefko. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Introduction When I set out to write about two sisters faced with the horror of sexual assault during wartime, I wasn't sure how readers would react. Would the story be off-putting? Too real? Not real enough? I breathed a sigh of relief when you wrote in your reviews about the impact the story had on you, that it was a story that needed to be told. The feedback I received was amazing. Thank you to all of you who wanted a sequel to Sisters at War. I picked up the story of the Beaufort sisters in wartime Paris where we left off at the Hôtel Drouot Auction House on May 8, 1942. Don't worry if you're unfamiliar with the story. I've sprinkled in backstory so you can jump right in. I've also enhanced the reunion scene with the two sisters that appears at the end of Sisters at War. Again, I must add a word of caution. In this novel, Sisters of the Resistance, I have written a story some readers may find disturbing, a story of sexual assault against women, mostly ignored by history, but more timely than ever. I pray you will come along with me as we continue on our journey. You're in for a bumpy ride. Gina Bacar, 2024 Prologue Paris, May 8th, 1942. Eve. It's rather odd what I remember about that hot August day less than two years ago when I witnessed my sister Justine being assaulted by an SS officer, Major Sachs Mullenheim. I record his name here so you may remember it, because when this war is over, I swear he will pay for what he did to her. I swear it. For now, I carry on, working with the resistance, committing acts of sabotage against the Nazis that this 20-year-old girl never dreamed she was capable of. Sneaking into rail yards and setting fuses, blowing up locomotives, writing political tracts, and printing leaflets to rally protests against the occupiers and begging others to join the fight. But on that summer afternoon, there was no resistance, no printed words of defiance against the invaders, just a busy bee buzzing in my ear while I gathered herbs in the garden for my science experiments, the subtle scent of sweet basil tickling my nose. Humming, I fussed with the pink velvet ribbon Justine had given me to tie back my long hair, while my brain barely registered the sound of black hobnailed boots stomping on the polished floor like a drum roll announcing what was to come. The SS major grabbed me first and threatened to assault me before my brave Justine came to my rescue, her blue eyes blazing and her spirit on fire. But coward that I am, I didn't fight hard enough to save my sister when he took her instead. Which is why every day I relive the horror of that afternoon when I retreat into the purple shadows here in the library at Maison des Ombres Bleues, the house of blue shadows. The Grand Maison is named for the deep blue shadows that flood the library every day at twilight like a pool of mystical magic, my refuge. We, Justine and I, call it Maison Bleu, a three-story mansion, très French in its décor, but with a swash of imperial Russia apparent in its appointments, thanks to its mistress, Madame Ekaterina de Giacomte, a woman with exquisite taste and a flair for the dramatic all accompanied by the chirps of her two lovebirds in a golden cage, like dining on a cloud from another time. Ever since I was a little girl, 
I've gone to the library to think. Let its shadows wrap me in an invisible cloak where I could dream, be whatever I wanted to be. I was a girl so innocent then, my heart filled with sentiment, and I'd smile over how Justine loved to tease me about my obsession with counting the petals on a daisy, my mind as hungry as the soil to absorb knowledge. Someday you'll find your prince, Ev. It's not a prince I'm wishing for, dear sister. I'm thinking how fragile life is, like a daisy, that it can lose its petals to a brisk wind or under the heel of a shoe, smashing it to the ground. What are you talking about? She asked, curious. How fate plays a role in our lives. Fate. Surely we can steer our own destiny? Can we, Justine? I'd raise a brow, pull off a petal. Who knows? I didn't find out how right I was until the war came and the Nazi major invaded our home, intent on looting precious works of art. He'd walked in through the front portal without knocking, as if he were the master of the house. Damn Nazi had no right, I'd said, but that didn't stop him from poking his nose into the library tossing admiring grunts at the art hanging on the walls, asking me questions. Jews live here, n'est-ce pas? How had he known? Monsieur and Madame de Giacomte, yes? I'd nodded. I work for Monsieur and Madame, I'd told him. French philanthropists and members of the elite Parisian bourgeoisie. So you're not Jewish? No. He'd taken a step closer as if noticing me for the first time. His direct gaze gave me goosebumps, like when a certain biology professor at school had asked me to stay after class to explain my experiment, growing mold on a petri dish. He'd spent the entire time putting his hand on my knee, not listening to a word I'd said. I suspected, in that moment, that this SS officer possessed the same dirty mind. He'd continued, Gut. I shall commandeer the paintings of the De Gia Comte for safekeeping, in the name of the Reich, of course. Really? I'd looked at this invader, disbelieving. He was lying, had to be. I couldn't believe the Nazis would have the nerve to steal these magnificent works of art from the De Gia Comte. I had no idea then that Himmler had stuck his woodpecker's beak into the Paris art world. Later, I discovered that he had ordered the SS to loot art. At the time, all I knew was that the invasion of Maison Bleu by this SS major was an insult to the De Gia Comte. And what did being Jewish have to do with anything? I didn't know then that being Jewish was everything. The Führer himself had given the SS the power to confiscate Jewish property, and that included these exquisite paintings at Maison Bleu. I'd stood there, indignant and unwilling to accept that fact, thinking he couldn't be serious about his threat. The De Gia Comte are influential and prominent members of the French Jewish community and are not to be trifled with, I'd said. I was of the mind they'd have his rank knocked down for his arrogance. In my naivete, I believed they had that much power, not only because of their financial holdings, but also their elite ranking in the Paris art world as avid collectors of works with a noble provenance. Again, life under the occupation hadn't sunk in yet. There would be no comeuppance for this SS officer's outrageous behavior. I soon discovered in this new Nazi world order, no one dared to say no. And that included me. I should have kept my mouth shut and ignored the German staring at the walls of art, pacing up and down the library, nodding his approval like a royal minister, except one who wore a double lightning bolt insignia on his uniform. Even then I'd sensed here was a man obsessed with what he couldn't have his hunger to possess beautiful things for the sheer hedonistic pleasure. And like all Nazis, 
the Major considered himself superior to anyone and took what he wanted without asking. I jerked my head around when I heard the pounding of more boots on the Italian marble floor. More German soldiers. In fact, a two-man crew going in and out quickly, carrying the artwork out to the waiting truck covered with a tarpaulin. Or was there another reason? Yes, he'd wanted the paintings for himself. When I'd protested the art theft, he'd then grabbed me, touched me, his black-gloved hands knowing no boundaries. With his Aryan smugness, he slammed me up against the library wall, rubbing his chest against my breasts and pushed against my thin print dress. It was ugly, degrading. Why me? I'm plain, I thought. The girl nobody notices. The girl lost in her books and science experiments at the Sorbonne laboratories back when they were still open. Not feminine and curvy like my sister Justine. I never expected this Nazi monster to invade our home and claim me along with the De Gia Comte's art collection, including the painting of Justine and me officially known as the Beaufort Sisters, but to us, always the Daisy Sisters, because the avant-garde female artist had painted us a wash in bright yellow daisies, a poster-sized painting that made me feel warm inside every time I gazed at it, hanging on the satin-embossed wall at Maison Bleu. I'd smelled my own ripe fear, rising from my sweaty armpits when I defied the SS officer. He mumbled, I too was a spoil of war, and his for the taking, along with the art hanging on the walls of the Grande Maison. The house is a glorious place near Rue Monceau, on a street so tiny it has no name. A beautiful garden and greenhouse provide outdoor calm and serenity, but inside the mansion beats the heart of Maison Bleu. The character of the home hung on those walls, glorious old masters and flamboyant, lovely impressionists. I swear the house wailed and moaned when the major ordered the German soldiers to rip down the paintings and confiscate the artwork collected for years by Monsieur and Madame de Giacomte. Who could stop them? We were alone in the house. The de Giacomte had left for Deauville, the servants gone, cook and the two maids, Lucy and Albertine. Maman had been at work upstairs on her sewing machine. She's a seamstress for Madame and adores her. No one was there to prevent the Bosch major from carrying out his nefarious deed. No one but me. I'd stood my ground refusing to cower before him, but that hadn't stopped him. He had no qualms about groping me with his black-gloved fingers, the fine leather crackling when he ran his hand over the bare skin between my thighs. I'd squeezed my eyes tight, bit down on my lip. I knew what he intended, wanted. I just couldn't form the word on my lips. Rape? No, I won't give in to him, I thought. I'll fight him, kick him, whatever vile thing he tries to do to me. He'll get no crying, no pleading from me. But I hadn't counted on my sister Justine, jumping into the scene, defending me. Let her go, monsieur, she cried out. The major laughed. Who are you? Her hand to her throat, her eyes wide, Justine stepped forward. I repeat, monsieur, she said, gritting her teeth. Take your hands off my sister. Your sister, his voice deepened, his interest peaked. Yes, she's impulsive and didn't mean to offend you. I'll let her go, he gloated, if you trade places with her. Monsieur, shocked, she clutched the doll she was holding to her chest, a 19th century lady doll she used to design Madame's gowns. It's your choice, mademoiselle. I intend to have one of you. He looked from Justine to me, or both. Justine raised her chin, her steel blue eyes defiant. You wouldn't dare, monsieur, wouldn't I? 
I'll never get that scene out of my head when the SS officer grabbed Justine. It haunts me to think that for her courage, my wonderful sister was kidnapped, her dress in tatters, her pride stripped away, her virginity shattered like a lovely painted vase, a vase that can only be broken once. The arrogant Nazi tore the doll from her hand and smashed it to the floor, its open glass eyes staring at me, accusing me. It should have been you, Ev. Yes, it should have been me, not Justine. Golden, honey blonde, my sister was a living, breathing symbol of Parisian womanhood, her femininity so appealing to the debauched Nazi, he groaned out loud when he saw her. Panting like a tiger hot for a mate, the SS officer pushed me aside like a day-old croissant, then went after Justine. He couldn't leave her alone, his hunger so acute to taste the forbidden fruit of his conquest, running his hands up and down her slender body while she'd flinched and I'd watched, helpless. Justine had yelled for me to run, go. I'd shrieked, no, I couldn't leave her. I had to do something, but what? My plea to stop meant nothing to the Nazi. He'd have no one but her. Justine had held her silence, pushing back against the SS major when he'd ripped her dress open down the front, then fondled her breasts, and he didn't stop. The horror on her face was like watching a beautiful jumeau doll set on fire, then melt before me into a puddle of humiliation. He'd laughed, the raw lust in his eyes, forewarning what he had in store for her. Justine then looked over at me, her eyes begging me not to do anything that would get us and Maman shot. Without missing a beat, he then forced Justine into his Mercedes touring motor car with the tiny swastika flag flying on the hood, the vehicle scattering gravel as it sped away down the private driveway taking my sister, shivering, and trying to keep her torn dress closed, the Nazi snorting and panting with delight, congratulating himself. He'd scored not only the paintings from the wealthy Jewish family, but the beautiful blonde as well, Justine. Taken. I never saw her again. Now back in the library, I shake my head in denial still. How could he have taken her from me? From Maman? From Maison Bleu? The home we'd known since we were little girls? I can't say how I survived that day, but I did. I went on to university and focused on my studies. I was a first-year student at the Sorbonne and as content as a bluebird flying free when my nose was in a petri dish. Then the Nazis poked their noses into our lives and closed the school, so I joined an underground network to fight the Bosch. But I knew deep down in my heart I'd never let go of the mystery of what happened to my sister. I did everything in my power to bring her home. I reported Justine missing and the sexual assault to the French police. They ignored me, insisting an SS officer would never commit such an act. She's dead, they told me then tossed my inquiry into a dustbin. Afterward, I grieved for her, cried for her, and blamed myself for what happened when the heel of the black hobnail boot crushed my world. Those memories remain still, stuck in the back of my mind like a ghostly hum that never stopped, reminding me, taunting me. I tried to push them deep down in my soul to assuage my guilt, though, and instead vowed to go on, keeping her memory safe and warm in a special place in my heart. Until today, at Hotel Duo, when my dead sister came out of the shadows, very much alive and working for the Bosch. Chapter One Paris May 8th, 1942. Ev. 
for two years. Two years. Confusion and outrage had swirled in my brain, believing the sister I adored had died at the hands of the SS. Sexually assaulted before my eyes. Kidnapped. Then she disappeared. Until this woman shows up at the Hotel Drouot, insisting she's my sister Justine. Peering through a thin blue veil, she looks smug and indignant when she corners me in the main auction house in Paris, wearing an outrageous hat. It's dramatic, shaped like a blue oyster with a choker of pearls dangling from the high crown, with a long veil shimmering with shiny sequins trailing down her back. Her hair is dyed platinum blonde, and she reeks of collabo in a teal silk suit woven as fine as mist. Her eyes sparkling, but cold, blue ice. Mui, it is Justine. I can't believe it. My sister, so elegant and clever, moving with grace among the crowd of greedy art patrons and stiff Nazi officers, smiling in her most charming manner and cloaked with a supreme confidence, like her feet aren't touching the ground as if she belongs here with them, les boches. It's obvious, n'est-ce pas? Justine sold her soul to the Nazis. I can't believe she aligned herself with the enemy for a new hat. No fear, no embarrassment just a coolness about her that made me think she was carved from smooth white marble while I burn inside. Yes, I speak with anger and pain laced with dark humor. But shock does that to you, turns your cold grief into a hot ball of fire, makes you fight back against this new truth because the old truth was something you'd learned to live with, to accept not this chic Nazi collaborator. I know I'm judging her by her stylish clothes and that over-the-top hat, but you must understand I can't even mend my worn-out shoes because the Germans shipped all the leather back to the Vaterland. I go numb, seeing Justine involved in God only knows what dirty Nazi business is a kick to my heart. And if I don't find some ridiculous notion like that hat, something I can grab onto to explain her shameless behavior, I shall go mad. How in the name of our dearest maman did it come to this? This insane afternoon at the Hotel Drouot came about when I saw the notice in the Gazette that the stolen painting the Beaufort sisters was up for viewing this afternoon. The painting, along with others looted from the De Giacomp's private collection, isn't going on the auction block today, but it is scheduled to be shipped to Nice for an upcoming special auction at the Hotel Savoy. I was so anxious to see it again, I didn't care if I have to put up with snooty art dealers and a maddening melee of bargain hunters eager to get in on the deals. I can't remember a day when I didn't look at that painting and give thanks for our mamma's ingenuity when we were little girls to find us a home with Madame de Giacomte. The elegant woman thinks of us as the granddaughters she never had, her kindness giving us a wonderful life in a fashionable district of Paris. I'd often stare at the beautiful painting of Justine and me back when we were young girls filled with romance and dreams. I was 14 in 1936 when I'd sat for the famous female artist with my sister, then 16. She depicted us in masterful brushstrokes, wrapped up in a field of daisies. Brilliant yellows and silky white petals, so lifelike you'd swear you could smell the scent of fresh flowers and feel the breeze amongst the swaying stalks blowing onto your cheeks. I'm here to steal back the Daisy sisters, which is why I'm armed with a Luger I'd taken off a Nazi guard when I'd blown up a German depot with a homemade bomb some weeks before. My specialty. I can put together a fuse and a charge, dynamite 
and a stick of phosphorus and set the Nazis flying on their backsides in record time. I've become quite the saboteur since the war began, and I'm proud of it. I put my studies in chemistry to good use, lying on my belly in the dirt, setting up an explosive on a railroad track. I swear I can reach up to the sky where freedom still shines and grab a burning star to set off the fuse. I'm damn good at what I do, and I've never been caught. I don't intend to get caught today, so I'd hidden the pistol in my jacket pocket and plopped Maman's old black hat with its droopy feather on my head to look respectable. No one would guess I'm armed. The Luger might come in handy if I have to bluff my way out of a dangerous situation. I've never handled a German-made gun before. All we resistors usually have are old weapons left over from the Great War, ones that Michal secured from a pawn shop on Rue Saint-Jacques. He never said where he got the bullets, but I suspect the shop is a front for another resistance cell. Ah, yes, Michal. I take a moment to ponder my girlish fascination with this man. My female urges swell into a rolling wave when I think about him. A man I barely understand, though I want to badly. Polish guerrilla fighter, he says, but I know there's more to his story. He's too knowledgeable about Nazi strategy and warfare to be a regular soldier, and how he handles himself in hand-to-hand -hand combat shows a man of experience. His ability to lead give commands, and his overwhelming charm, suave, tough, and smart, a man I've fallen for against my will. Whenever he looks at me, brushes up against my arm or grabs my hand when we run for our lives from a German patrol, I don't want to let him go. He makes me laugh when I want to cry, and he has made me cry when he's thrown himself into danger to protect me. I protest that I can take care of myself. But it's so wonderful to have a man like him in my life, even if he doesn't see me as a woman with feelings and needs. I'm his partner, and we share everything. The risks, the responsibilities, everything. Except a bed. Nothing more. I have tried to keep it that way, have fought against my attraction to him, not least because I've always thought of myself as not being good-looking enough to attract a man who drips masculinity, a man brave enough to escape from the Nazis in war-torn Warsaw, a man whose heart and soul is committed to freedom. Why would such a man want to crawl into bed with a tall, lanky girl with dynamite powder smudged on her face? But Michal has got under my skin in the most marvelous way with his wit and courage, and how he looks at me, with respect. And every once in a while, the war ceases to exist, when his eyes light up with a sparkle I feel is just for me, when I let down my waist-length hair, and I feel pretty, really pretty. Of course, Michal would never approve of my crazy scheme to steal back the painting of Justine and me. He'd tell me it was too risky. I wouldn't have listened to him. How could I? He'd never understand the insatiable need I have to get back something from my old life before the war, something to make me feel normal again. My plan was simple. Blend in with the crowd and then hide and wait for closing time so I can take back what the Nazis took from us. Remove it from the frame, roll it up and stash it in my empty satchel. It should have worked. It would have worked, but the dream shattered when Justine showed up. I'm still reeling from seeing her dolled up like she stepped out of La Mode, though most Parisians can't even get a decent pair of shoes. The Hotel Drouot is the last place I expected to find my sister milling around with art patrons and anxious investors wrapped up in greed and desperation. It made me nauseous to see the bidders clutching their programs and circling like vultures, intent on buying up objets d'art looted from French Jews. How can she live with herself? It makes me sick to my stomach. 
The auction house smells of ripe Gallic sweat and Nazi arrogance, an unlikely duo coming together under one roof, loud and outbidding each other. Justine must have known I'd show up to see the painting, along with the art stolen from the Dugia Comte. The painting meant the world to me because it was all I thought I had left of my sister. Now I'm not so sure it matters. I'd taken a seat in Hall 1 on the first floor when Justine caught my eye. I barely recognized her. I thought I was seeing things. I blamed it on too many missions, working with Michal, sabotaging Nazi trains going east, my brain rattled by loud explosions, my nostrils filled with the smell of chemicals and dust. But no, the ghost of my sister is real. I studied this woman I thought dead, staring at me, anxious, wetting her lips, alternating with her looking at me with coy glances then at the Gestapo man in the black trench coat sitting in the corner working a crossword puzzle, his head down. He looked familiar. Am I crazy? I thought. I swear I saw him at the American Hospital of Paris with a blonde when I rushed Michal there after he was shot by a German patrol. I thought then the woman resembled my sister. Now I know it was her. Next, she sets the stage, why she tricked me into showing up here today. The question is, do I take the bait? Justine makes a bid of 70,000 francs for a Corot painting expected to fetch nearly a million francs, waits for a higher bid, then floats towards the exit of the hall like she caught the tail of a breeze. What's her game? The Justine I have seen today is no longer that young idealist I knew, a portrait of sweet maidenhood. She's changed. Her eyes are piercing, her lips redder and fuller, her confidence snooty and self-absorbed, as if she swallowed a magic potion that turned her into an evil queen. She's working for the bush, otherwise she'd have come home to Maison Bleu, n'est-ce pas? She turns as she leaves and smiles at me, her big blue eyes bidding me to follow her. Follow her? I hesitate. I suspect a trap but I can't help myself. The temptation to speak to her, hear her voice, ask her why she betrayed France, betrayed me, is too great. A glance at her rear view reveals her shapely curves, sexy, her elegant figure no doubt pleasing to the Nazi hierarchy. I shake my head. I can't understand why she'd collaborate with the Nazis after that SS major sexually assaulted her. Every day I tell myself it should have been me. I can't let her get away without an explanation. How can I resist? Heart pounding, I race after her, my mind confused. I can't understand how, why she let me think she was dead. Swaying her hips, she lures me to the dingy, low-ceilinged basement of the five-story art auction house. I hear her precious voice for the first time in two years, but she's boasting that while I'm groveling for food with a ration card, she's designing hats for German wives in a fancy milliner's shop on Rue de Rivoli, the house of Peroline. Hats? It turns my stomach. Fawning over the enemy while French women starve, then she has the nerve to make fun of my hat, Maman's hat. Droopy and sad, its gray-blue feather poking me in the eye. The poor thing is all tuckered out from bucking the fierce Teutonic winds blowing through the city. Frazzled and done, like me. My heart tugs when Justine criticizes the battered black chapeau sitting atop my head. She knows it was Maman's, and how much it means to me, because she was wearing that hat the day we first met Madame de Giacomte, which made it more hurtful that she'd denigrate our dearest mother like she was a troublesome servant? I stutter, my emotions so intense, I feel lightheaded. Dealing with Justine's betrayal is a shock that has me knotted up so tight inside I can't let go of the pistol clutched in my hand, my fingers numb, cramped. 
I lost all feeling in my body, seeing her strutting like a smug Nazi princess. Every wonderful memory we had as sisters growing up at Maison Bleu flashing before me. Two little girls dipping their fingers into Cook's soft confectionery sugar when her back was turned and licking them clean, then munching on almond cream-filled croissant, crunchy with pecans, so sweet our teeth hurt. Our every whisper and giggle, intimate as only sisters can be. What happened to us? Our hopes, our dreams, our sisterly bond? God, I ache down to my bones. All the worry and pain and grieving I've done over losing Justine, popping like a blister when she steps back into my world like this. My attention is no longer on her silly hat. I purse my lips and look her straight in the eye. Her pretty face glows with a mannequin-like sheen on her pink skin like she's not real. I wonder for a moment if she is, for she makes no move to come closer. Is she happy to see me? Will she hug me, kiss me on each cheek? No. My sister declares war on me. Chapter 2 Paris, May 8th, 1942. Eve, the basement of the Hotel Drouot. You must leave Paris, Eve, for your own good. I stand rooted to the spot, like a duck with its big, webbed feet stuck in the mud, listening to Justine's open declaration of war. War between us. Her pouty expression clearly stating there isn't room in the city for two Beaufort sisters. No? Let the battle begin. You know I'd never leave Maman, and she'd never leave Madame de Giacomte. I lift my chin. The two of them are still grieving. Justine rolls her eyes. Over what? Did Maman run out of wool for her dear POWs? Our Maman hasn't stopped knitting socks for French POWs since the armistice. No, I say flatly. It's Monsieur de Giacomte. He's, he's not with us anymore. For a moment, I see fear splash in her eyes, turning them a dark blue. Then it's gone. What are you talking about? Monsieur was in excellent health. Don't pretend you don't know. Know what? Her eyelids flutter. Is she acting? The French police arrested Monsieur de Giacomte last December, along with 700 other Jewish men, and deported him on a train east. My shoulders slump. Deep worry for this good man, making it difficult for me to finish. We have no idea where he is. If he's even still alive. That's impossible she says in a huff. Damn, the major promised me the de Giacomte would be safe. Not that I care. They are Jewish, but I don't want to see Maman living on the pavements and coming to me for handouts. The major is a liar, I shoot back. She doesn't answer me. By her silence, she agrees, which gives me a chance to make my plea to get her back. He raped you, Justine. What spell has he cast over you? You wouldn't understand. You don't see anything else besides your silly experiments. I groan. Another insult. Please, I beg you, join us, and we'll fight the Bosch side by side. Sisters belong together. I can't, Ev. It's, it's too dangerous. For me. For you. She adjusts her veil even if you are my sister. I can't keep protecting you if you insist on participating in insurrection against the Reich. What? Strange words I never thought I'd hear from my own sister. I don't understand you, Justine, I admit. Why do you stay with that German pig? Her eyes widen. I'd watch your tongue, Ev. The Major is a distinguished SS officer. With everything he's done for me, I have no choice. We all have a choice, dear sister. Again, silence, then. I don't. Nor do I wish one. 
Besides, she grins big, I rather enjoy the privileges that go along with being the major's girl. New leather shoes, a pretty apartment, lunch at the Ritz. She smacks her lips. They serve the most delicious steak tartare. Damn, she's frustrating me. Justine doesn't like raw beef. I'm done. I can't hold in how I feel, no matter how awful it sounds. You're a coward, Justine, letting Momo and me believe you were dead when all along you've been cavorting with the bush. I call it acceptance. I do what I must to survive, Ev, and you'd be wise to do the same. Her tone is harsh, pushy. This isn't the sister I know. Now go, or I won't be responsible for what happens to you. Or Maman, is that clear? Did she really say that? I stand there, my mouth open, still holding on to that damn satchel, even if my plan is foiled. I oozed with frustration a moment ago, but it's nothing compared to the sinking feeling that sucks the energy out of me. When I'm around Justine, I feel ordinary because she's so pretty and I'm not, and well, I can live with that, but she never made me feel unwanted and that breaks me into a million pieces. My big feet feel like they're stuck in quicksand and it's pulling me down. The sad part is I don't try to free myself. Why bother? I've just lost the happiest part of my life and the ending to this story hurts me. Then Justine goes on a rant, insisting I should thank her for warning me to leave Paris. I'm taking a great chance, Ev, arranging this meeting. I take in a slow breath. Why bother if you're going to humiliate me? She pushes the veil behind her ear, but she won't look at me. Because, dear sister, you're an embarrassment to me and it has to stop now. Prissy, isn't she? Oh, and you sleeping with the enemy isn't an embarrassment? I shoot back. She works her jaw and takes a moment before she blurts out, Mon Dieu, Ev, don't you know what you're doing with your silly student demonstrations, hanging out with radicals and communists? Your stupidity put you on a Gestapo list. Oh God, how can you be sure? Herr Geller, the Gestapo man you saw working the crossword puzzle, told me. So she knows I'm working with the underground? How? I have to think, fast, deny everything I hear Michal telling me, as if he's done this before. How did he escape from the Nazis? Is that why he's so seasoned? His advice works for now, then what? Somehow, Justine unraveled my secret life with the resistance and hit me hard with her accusation, like cotton threads snapped when pulled taut. Who told her? Have we a traitor in our network? Our maman is also on the list, she adds with a smirk to shock me. I freeze. Maman? On a Gestapo list? She is joking. She isn't. She repeats it to me, her voice so cold and devoid of emotion, her face frozen with a perpetual smile you know isn't real like when the Nazis pretend to be your friend. Justine doesn't even try to be my sister. She's mean, stuffy, and smug. Seeing what she's become, I hang my head in shame, then lower my eyes so she can't see the wetness on my cheeks. With those words, she erases me from her life as easily as ripping off a satin hat band. Our close sisterly bond torn apart with each sharp word she hisses at me through her teeth. But there's something else. I can feel it as only a sister can. Festering so deep in her heart, her cheeks flame from keeping it in, something she's desperate to share but can't. I know my sister, know the signs when she's biting at the bit. 
a soft tear smearing the rouge on her cheek, a look of longing at Maman's hat, a tenderness in her voice she can't hide. Justine is keeping a secret. What? Why? What could mean so much to her that she wouldn't risk coming home to Maison Bleu, to Maman, to Madame de Giacomte? I can't accept that she'd stay with a man so cruel, so heartless, unless... Oh, did she? When I look at her closer, I see her breasts are fuller, her cheeks high with deep circles visible under her eyes. But she also appears wiser, like she observes the world through a different lens, where her life no longer revolves around silken threads cut on the bias, but something so precious she's willing to risk everything. Why didn't I see it before? What kind of sister am I? Justine has a child. She doesn't say it, but the softness in her eyes, the catch in her voice, the haunting breath that escapes her lips, tell me what I need to know. The birth of her baby is a cord she can't ever cut. No matter her feelings for him, it ties her to the Nazi bastard who raped her, Perhaps he convinced her that his sin makes her a collaborator. It's not true, of course. But I know my sister. Justine was only ever a creator, a weaver of dreams, always in color, not black and white. Because she sees life in bold reds, calming blues, and sensational yellows. Which means she'll do anything to keep her world and her babies from turning beetle green, the color of Nazi uniforms, even if it means staying with the Major in spite of his monstrous act to keep her child safe. I let go with a lonely sigh. I understand. Well, almost. My mouth droops, and I can't will my lips into a smile. The guilt overwhelming me keeps me silent while I process the ache growing inside me. My heart weeps for Le Bebe. I'm filled with concern for her and her child. How can I blame Justine? What would I have done? I'm afraid to answer that, so I don't. For now, I wish I could cradle my niece or nephew in my arms and comfort them, let them know they have family who loves them. For how could I blame an innocent child for the mother's sin of collaboration, even if she is my sister? Justine stares at me, says nothing, but I've never seen such frustration in her at keeping quiet. I know I'm right about the child. My sister was never very good at keeping anything from me. Doesn't she trust me to keep her secret? That hurts the most. No, I can't let her go. I convince myself I can save her. I take a step to reach out to her. Justine, please listen to me. Her eyes narrow. I have to go. Adieu, my little sister. No, you can't. I won't let you. You can't stop me, Ev. No. I slide my hand into my jacket pocket and wrap the cold metal of the German service revolver in my palm. She can't show up and then run off without an explanation. Hint there's more going on with her than she's willing to share. I won't let her. I owe it to Maman, to Madame de Giacomte, who took us in and gave us a home. I was eight, and Justine was ten, and we lived in the slums in the north of Paris with Maman after Papa met the wrong end of a dagger in a street fight. I can't live with seeing their hearts broken if they find out Justine is a collaborator. They never need know if I can just change her mind and bring her home. You're not leaving, Justine. Before I can grasp the consequences of my foolish action, I draw the pistol from my pocket, my finger tightening on the trigger, hoping to scare some sense into my sister. I'd never hurt her. And why I've done that? A moment of panic, I imagine. I don't know, as if a stolen Luger is the answer? 
You haven't got the guts to shoot me, Ev. Don't I? Comes my choking response. You're a collaborator, Justine, and... They shoot traitors, races through my mind, but I can't say it out loud. My hand shakes with a sharp fear I never expected, that I hold such power in that hand. I've never fired a pistol before, never had to, and now I'm pointing it at my sister? Am I crazy? It's over, Ev. That silly part of our girlhood, the Daisy sisters, is no more. A dream, a fantasy, gone, poof. She mimics pulling apart a make-believe flower with her gloved fingers. Her eyes narrow, destroying my girlhood memory when she'd listened to my meanderings and didn't make fun of me. And what's a daisy without its petals? Swishing her veil over her shoulder, she turns on her heel and walks away, but not before she looks over her shoulder, pouts her lips, and sways her body in an arrogant manner before she pushes a pile of old dishes off a nearby table. Crash, flying off the table, landing on the basement floor so hard, the dishes explode into pieces, sending a cloud of white, chalky dust into the air. Choking, I drop the satchel and go after her, but I don't get far. The silly feather from Maman's hat keeps getting into my face. Then I hear a scuffle somewhere up ahead. Justine? Did someone attack her? Where is she? There's no light in the basement corridor. Damn, I can't see clearly. I lurch forward in my platform heels, banging my knee against an old armoire and stumbling over the pile of dishes broken into so many pieces I trip over my own feet and stupidly squeeze the trigger and... The burst of gunfire shatters what's left of the dishes, sending shards flying everywhere and knocking the breath out of me. The kickback lands me on my backside. I fired one shot into the darkness. One shot. Did I hurt her? No. Maybe. I didn't hear her cry out. Oh, I don't know. I scramble to my feet, brush off sharp pieces of china, praying I don't cut myself. I have to find my sister, help her. My heart pounds madly, fear striking me, when a second shot echoes in my ears, and this time I do hear a woman scream. Justine. Oh, my God. Is she dead? Chapter 3 Paris, May 8th, 1942 Justine Moments before at the Hotel Drouot My sister Eve hates me. With the memory of the shocked look on her face piercing my heart, I walk quickly in my blue linen pumps through the maze of hallways to the auction house basement, knowing I'd wanted to speak to her, but desperate to escape her glaring eye. My ploy worked. I saw Ev, talked to her, but our reunion had disappointed me. Why am I surprised? I acted horribly, both harsh and hurtful, like rubbing lye soap on red, chapped hands and peeling away the skin like I had peeled away the happy years we spent growing up in Maison Bleu. We didn't embrace, didn't laugh or tease each other. It was so sad. Why? Because I'm the major's girl. A moniker I pretend to wear proudly around the SS officer. Everyone in Nazi society knows I'm the good little French girl who laughs at their dirty jokes and revels in the privileges I enjoy at the expense of my countrymen and women. And now Ev knows it too. I shiver, my hands shaking. Oh, I was horrible to her. I didn't recognize the words coming out of my mouth, foul and hateful, praising the Nazi regime. Yes, I lied to her. I had to. I'm no collaborator. But I stood there like a condemned saint and took my punishment. I didn't flinch, didn't show emotion. If anything, I arched a brow as arrogantly as I could muster and let her race through her tirade and accuse me of working for the Nazis. 
Yes, I let her believe I'd stoop that low. I did what I must to save her. Maman, Madame de Giacomte, and Ninette, my little girl. I never dreamed Eve would pull a gun on me, so I ran. My new shoes so tight, they pinch my toes. Crack. Oh, God, is that a pistol I hear firing? Did Eve shoot at me? Does she hate me that much? Of course she does. I'd hate me, too. This blonde soubrette spouting the rhetoric of a collaborator with the grooming of a pampered poodle. At that moment, my feet turn leaden, and I can barely continue my way up to the ground floor from the basement in the Hotel Drouot. I never should have been foolish enough to believe I'd come away from my rendezvous, leaving Eve unscathed. The reality that I've destroyed our relationship hits me hard. I have no sister now. I remember when she was who I would turn to for a warm hug or shed a tear with when I needed it. And oh, do I pine for it. I tried to reach her, if only in my imagination. But how do you embrace air? But I must protect my life and my own or work, because the truth is that I walk my own Maginot line between two worlds in this horrible war living a double life, working for the Allies and spying for the Germans. It goes like this. I feed the major disinformation I get from my Allied handler Arsène to the Nazis, while reporting to him the Nazi gossip I hear in the house of Paroline, the hat shop where I work on Rue de Rivoli. I also eavesdrop on conversations when the major introduces me as his French companion at the Hotel Ritz or Bal Tabarin Cabaret. Especially General von Klum, who has been a surprising bee in my bonnet since I took on this job. He's quite smitten with me, and I use that to my advantage. I can't imagine what my sister would say if she saw me flirting with the enemy but I've gained the confidence of the congenial general with the bushy brows who sniffs and snorts and noses around me like a lovesick puppy. He's loose with his cognac and his tongue, never believing a pretty woman, especially a French woman, has brains. I keep promising him more than a kiss on the cheek. It never happens. If he wasn't a Nazi, I'd almost feel sorry for the frustrated general. He can't get anywhere with me, but he assures me that he has no problem making moves on the Eastern Front. We'll be in Stalingrad by Christmas, mademoiselle, he whispered to me not long ago as I leaned over to fix the strap on my high heel sandal, showing him ample cleavage. Tradecraft. He wet his lips and put his hand on my knee. Then boasted German troops were on the move for a series of offensives, including their intention to launch a massive attack to the south and southeast. Why would you want to leave Paris for the cold Russian winter? I teased him. Why, mademoiselle, he said, squeezing my knee. Oil fields. Oh, I said, giggling encouraging him to tell me more about their plans to seize the oil fields of the Caucasus and cripple the Soviet war effort. Seems the Nazis are running out of the black gold. What surprised me is that, for a flicker of an instant, I saw doubt in the general's eyes. Frustrated and a bit tipsy, he blurted out that German troops aren't used to the bitter, frigid cold of Russia. How many men will be lost? What if they don't have enough oil? Will the fight be for naught? An unusual statement I won't forget, straight from the lips of a Nazi general. I never felt more certain in that moment I was doing worthwhile work. For France, the Allies, Arsène tells me that the intelligence I glean from him proves very useful to London. I'd never tell Eve, even if we were speaking since my work is top secret. In the back of my mind, I want to share with her like we used to do. I was a fool to think this war would be over by now, and she'd never find out I hobnobbed with the Nazi higher-ups. Now that hope is gone. I didn't want to believe it, but 
Isn't Ev shoving the cold barrel of a luger in my face proof enough? If I ever doubted the Gestapo man's warning that Ev is in the resistance, I don't anymore. Do I dare imagine she took the pistol from a dead Nazi? I have to smile. My bookish little sister has more guts than I imagined, which makes her more of a danger to me. More so now that Ev knows what I've become, the Major's mistress. It's all a dangerous game I play to keep my child safe. Ma chère Ninette, barely a year old. The Major has tried more than once to take her from me, but so far I've succeeded in foiling his plans. Still, I live in constant fear of losing my baby to his outrageous plan of sending her to a home for children born of liaisons with SS men. I stumble over excuses every time he brings it up, then die a thousand deaths when he sneaks up on me and rubs the back of my neck with his long, gloved fingers, his way of signaling he wants sex. A cold, precise act. No emotion from him. Numbness from me. I find no pleasure in his touch. I learned to push down the disgust I feel when he kisses my bare shoulder with lips that never burn with passion for anything but taking what isn't his. That doesn't mean I don't cry into my pillow at night, wishing for another man's touch, his strong arms holding me. Breathless, with desire, I hug myself tight, then run my cool fingers up and down my arms, pretending I'm not alone, and the wonderful man I dream about is teasing me with his touch. Arsène, my double agent, spy handler, strong, bold, and handsome. When I feel daring, I slide my hands over my ribcage and down to my thighs. My body aches with a need that evokes an emotion I never expected, that I can feel pleasure. Then it ends, and the shivers come again for the man who I long for, but who can never be mine. He knows my secret, but he has a job to do, and that doesn't include giving comfort to a woman like me, a Nazi mistress. Arsène is a British agent, though he's never admitted it outright. I've never seen his true self either because he is always in disguise, whether in a brothel, as an old soldier, or in church when he dons a priest's black robes and hears my confession. I've even seen him as a German soldier and a handsome debonair waiter at Bal Tabarin. Yet I've learned to look under the disguise, and more than once, I've taken in the powerfully masculine aura of the man and seen what my eyes don't, a strong soldier of the night who can be mysterious and grave one minute, then playful the next, especially with Ninette. She adores him and recognizes him no matter what cloak he wears. I think she has a sixth sense. She inhales him like me, there's a scent about him that's warm and adventurous, exotic yet comforting. A man, I sense, can face down any danger with his broad smile and fierce dark eyes, but he also has great heart. I think too often about him holding me tight in his arms, my breasts squeezed against his broad chest, and yes, I've thought about kissing him. His lips brushing against mine, his hands tight around my waist. Then, shocked by my brazenness, I disband that idea. Impossible. A sinner like me has no right to wish for a man's embrace. Two years after the major raped me, and I still feel guilty, feeling that it was my fault because I didn't resist hard enough. Yes, I know such resistance often results in a woman's death at the hand of her abuser, but will I ever get over it? I wonder. It's a thread in the fabric of your life, Arsène says, insisting I will learn to stop punishing myself. How can I? The Vichy government blames us women for the defeat of France. That because we fought for freedoms denied to us before the Nazis took over, because we entered the workforce, 
It's our fault we didn't produce enough babies. So many husbands and lovers died in the Great War. The birth rate declined. You neglected your duty, they say, to bear children. Which makes me wonder what the Vichy government would say about me having a child for the occupier. Would they cheer me or stone me? The thought makes me queasy. More disturbing to my psyche is what will happen to women like me after the war is over. I can't believe the Allies won't win. But when I defend my actions, will angry Parisians believe me that I was a double agent? What I did? Why I did it? Give me a chance to prove it? I pray so. Winning the war is what counts, not me. I stifle a tear. I do worry about Nanette. A deep sadness drenches me. If only Eve knew about my child, she'd adore my little girl. I almost told her, almost, but I stopped at the last second. I can't ever tell her, lest she hate my child too. Oh, the insufferable pain that Nazi has caused me. I try to go on each day, do what I must to survive, bide my time until the day I can speak up after we oust the Bosch from Paris. Then I will toss away my shame and stand publicly and testify against Major Saxe Mullenheim, declare in a clear voice what he did to me and others like me. Innocent women whose only crime was catching his eye. I can't believe he won't be accused of war crimes, and I'll be first in line to speak the truth about him. Yes, I seek revenge, but first we have to win this war, which is why I had to make Eve believe I work for the Nazis. Now she's so angry with me, it makes me shudder. Isn't that what I wanted, though? Isn't that the only way to keep her and Maman and Madame de Giacomte safe? to keep the Gestapo away from them until I can work out a plan with Arsène to get them out of Paris? God help me. How I miss my dear sister. I can't get my old life with Ev out of my mind. Before the Nazis occupied Paris in June 1940, each day was a glorious adventure of art and scrumptious food and dreams as magical as a rainbow. Even when the sun didn't shine after a rainy day, Ev and I believed in that rainbow. It was in our hearts, nurtured not only by our wise maman, but Madame de Giacomte. She made us her family, listened to us, helped Ev with admittance to the Sorbonne, and championed my designs with her lady friends as if they came from the best couture house in Paris. We thought the ride would never end. Were we really so innocent back then? We lived in a grand house near Parc Monceau, where our maman is a seamstress for the wealthy Jewish banker Monsieur Itzak de Giacomte and his exquisite Russian-born wife Ekaterina, a prominent cello player. Madame de Giacomte insisted we were safe there. Why not? The de Giacomte's family enjoyed the position of valued members of the community, she was quick to say, having settled in France over 200 years ago from Venice, bringing with them a fortune in jewels. I disagreed. We heard what happened to Jews in Germany and Poland, and I feared the de Giacomte would be targets. I wanted to rally against the Nazis, but how? No one had a clue. And no one saw what was coming. That the Nazis are beasts and show no respect toward women, even their own. The major told me how young girls in Germany are chosen for their Aryan purity to breed with the SS. Imagine, he has this wild idea about opening such a home for girls here in France. It won't happen. It can't. But I know that was on his mind the day he invaded our home. I shall never forget seeing Eve in the clutches of the major trying to act grown up brave. But she was just a child, barely 18. 
the debauched SS officer snorted and smacked his lips with one thing on his mind, rape. I couldn't let that happen to her. So I went with that monster, this man who delights in taunting me with brash threats about taking my child Ninette away from me to be raised by a good German family. Does any woman of violent rape ever refer to a baby born from that moment as our child? I know I can't. I can deal with the major, but for now my job is to keep Ev from getting herself killed, because I know my sister, she's not giving up the fight. If she doesn't lie low, she'll end up in the hands of the infamous Gestapo man. Pudgy, round-faced with eyesight as sharp as a bullet and just as deadly. Hair, Abacus Geller. The man is obsessed with carrying out the law and routing out resistance fighters. He keeps a list of suspects and checks them off one by one, or so the major told me. He first suspected Ev when she was seen hanging around the Musée de l'Homme, Museum of Mankind, before they arrested the leaders of the network last year. He hasn't let up since, putting her name on his list. It's a game to him, and in his mind, if there's even the slightest chance she's connected to the underground, he pursues it with vigor. He became determined to prove it when he saw Ev at the American Hospital of Paris under dubious circumstances when he escorted me back to my apartment after I fainted at the Bal Tabarin. My sister had accompanied a man with a gunshot wound, and in Herr Geller's mind, that tags him as a resistance fighter. Now he's consumed not only with making my life miserable, but also Ev's. I sense a deep hurt in him that turned this Gestapo man's heart blacker than the devil's arse. It's nothing he said. He reveals no information about his personal life. It's the intense stare he throws out when he plays his hand, catching you in his web. A macabre pleasure shining in his eyes, watching you squirm. I wouldn't be surprised if he trapped rats when he was a boy and chopped off their tails and watched them run around in circles. He's cruel, calculating, and greedy. He's blinded by the strictness of the law and sees nothing but black and white. Like the crossword puzzles, he obsessively completes. Determination to stay free of his clutches scorches the bottoms of my feet. I rush up the stairs two at a time, determined to elude not only my sister but also the Gestapo man. Knowing he's capable of humiliating me is more than I can bear. Of course, he knows I'm Justine Beaufort and my sister is Ev Beaufort, but when he's angry with me, Herr Geller resorts to calling me Rachel d'Artois, a moniker bestowed upon me by the Major a sophisticated detail the SS man finds amusing when he introduces me to his circle of Nazi officers. Which reminds me, I can't forget when I heard Herr Geller discussing with the Major what happens to female prisoners detained at Gestapo headquarters en rue de Sosai. I'm not blind to his lack of subtlety. No doubt the Major encourages him. He speaks loudly, so I overhear him. How women suffer hard blows on their lower back and buttocks until they're covered with black bruises, how their most intimate places are abused in a manner so cruel I put my hands over my ears because I couldn't bear to hear anymore. I hate him, this buzzard who picks at its prey, not with sharp talons, but words that wound deep, so deep. I clench my gut tight, and I can't breathe. He reminds me often of my place in this chess game, how the Nazis dominate the royal pieces.